Hello and welcome to In Conversation. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about some new developments on campus as well as a very important planning initiative for the future of the university. My guest today is Dr. Jane Close Connolly, the President of California State University Long Beach. Welcome, Dr. Connolly, and thank you for joining us again on In Conversation. It's a pleasure to be here, Dave. Thank you. Well, every time we have a conversation on camera, it, it, maybe it's just me, but it always seems like the pace of development, the pace of implementation, and everything that goes on on campus seems to accelerate every time from the previous conversation. Mm -hmm. So we're moving briskly on all of our initiatives. Yes, we are, and that, it does cover every element, whether it's um, we're building or we're building academic programs or capital projects or we're changing processes about how we do business. It's, there's a lot of action in every sphere. Well, let's start with the first topic, and that is our numbers regarding graduation. We know that uh, last spring we graduated or we made eligible about 11,000 students for graduation. Mm -hmm. That includes both graduate students and undergrads, but most of them were undergrads. Yes. Uh -huh. So let's reflect on that for just a moment. What does that signify for the university? What does it indicate about what we're doing? And maybe on a larger scale, what does it really mean for the local community, the regional area, and the state of California? Mm -hmm. That's a, a great question. So uh, between 11 and 12,000 will probably graduate by December of 2019. And it really illustrates, I think, our, that we're a force for good. Because every graduate who leaves us and starts a career, uh, and often those are in critical need areas like nursing or teaching or engineering, they become part of a booming uh, California economy. Uh, and so their contribution as just entering the workforce, the new innovative work, innovation force that we need in California is a huge uh, uh, contribution. Also, college graduates uh, are most likely to pay taxes, least likely to need uh, public aid or least likely to be incarcerated. They lead healthier lives. So they're really contributors to a society. So, so often people imagine a college education as an individual good, but really it's a community good and a really an investment. Our work with our students really is um, a manifestation of our investment in the welfare of our region uh, and certainly the state of California. We recently released a economic impact study which illustrated a $1.5 billion uh, impact, economic impact on our um, region. And that, a lot of that came from the thousands of our alums who live here, work here, start businesses here, are entrepreneurs here, or who are physicians or teachers or nurses or engineers or artists and, you know, down the line. So I think that number is critical uh, because e the number equals people entering our community and really you know, doing good. And those are some impressive numbers. And I also detected within that answer the uh, suggestion of upward mobility and what that upward mobility does for the entire community and a lot of the communities that we serve. Absolutely. And um, as you may know, um, we've been in the top, sometimes top 20, now we're in the top 10 of universities nationwide who are considered um, engines of social mobility. And you know, we, we have to look at California as uh, a booming economy, but there are people who historically have been left behind. Now, because of our work, it's exactly those people uh, who are entering in the lowest quartile of economic resources, but five years out after graduation are in middle class, upper middle class, or even upper class uh, earning situations. And so that's, a, to me, that's my favorite ranking, to tell the truth, because to me, that's the American dream. Well, speaking of rankings, I want to mention another new development that just happened in the last month or two. Yeah. And it's a very exciting development involving Money Magazine, because Money Magazine does put out a report referred to as the best college value. And as the title suggests, it has to do with getting the most value for your money invested in a college education. Mm -hmm. And so they used three metrics in that particular survey. The first metric was quality of education, second one was affordability, and then the third one was outcome. And so that I can tell everyone the good news, there were 744 institutions, colleges and universities across the country, both private and public institutions. Mm -hmm. Among those 744, we finished 13th, which is quite an accomplishment, yes. especially uh -huh. when you consider that 
Harvard University finished 14th. Yes. <laughs> we can talk about that in a moment, but let's talk about those metrics of mm -hmm. quality of education and also affordability and outcome. Mm -hmm. What do those suggest about the universities and the rankings and where they fit? Well, I think this kind of ranking that money does and a few other places do now is a great improvement over former rankings, which you still just look at the size of your endowment, how many books were in your library, how, what were the average SATs of your incoming students. So they were really measuring the inputs, the, they weren't measuring the outcomes. And so with money and a few others, really looking at what happens after. Now, part of what happens after is, do you leave with crushing debt? Uh, fortunately, because of our you know, really careful stewardship across the CSU, but particularly here at Long Beach, um, half of our students leave with no debt. And the ones that do have debt, the average is about 16,000. Uh, that's far below the national average and far, far below, uh, and, and also far below the California average, which is lower than the national average. And I, th you know, I hope people will understand that d this debt, it's on people's mind, but much of it is really driven not by the regional public universities like ours, but by very high, you know, I, I recently looked at uh, uh, tuitions of c across the, uh, other universities, and some of them are at seventy-two thousand dollars a year if you have the whole whole package, you know. Versus our whole package, if you lived here, ate here, studied here, would be under twenty thousand dollars. So that affordability issue is very important. A lot of the newspaper stories people read, though, are really about those people who went to, you know, students who went to those seventy-two thousand dollar ticket uh, schools, and also people who got graduate degrees, and the, uh, maybe it's in medicine, especially law, others, and some in very predatory for-profit uh, places where the, the the sad thing was they paid a lot of money and they didn't get anything in return. So, so the quality obviously is important. The affordability critical for long-term. Uh, uh, you know, well-being and the social mobility is that's what we hope in America, in the United States of America, that with effort and you know grit, you can in fact change your economic um, existence and thereby change that for your certainly your family and really your community. And certainly, that's the outcome that they refer to. Yeah. And as far as the the rating is concerned, and we finished thirteenth. Why did we do so well? What are we doing? Uh, to merit us finishing at 13th? Well, I think um, certainly we continue to work on the quality of our programs and we continue to innovate. Uh, so our programs are matching real world um, demands now. And you, uh, you started by saying that pace of change has accelerated and that's certainly true in the workforce. Uh, and we have been, I think, very um, active and successful in introducing new programs and upgrading existing programs. So I think we always work on quality. Uh, we are among the CSUs, although being among the, one of the largest, we have some of the lowest fees among the 23 campuses. And we see that as a sign of pride. It's getting us in a little trouble in certain places where it's costing us more to you know, do it. So I, I can't guarantee, but even if we raised fees a little bit, it, we'd still be on the, the lower bottom five or three or two, you know. So we really work on affordability. You know, we never make a change in financial uh, demands on students without really careful consultation. And, you know, we, we kind of win on this. The reason we were ahead of Harvard is not because Harvard doesn't add to social mobility. They certainly do. But they take a tiny number of low-income students. We take a big number, and we are equally successful. So they, they lose out a little bit because they're only dealing with a, you know, a couple of percentage points, whereas our students, the Pell eligible, for example, that federal poverty line, they have well in the 50%, more than 50%, yeah. Mm -hmm. So our conveyor belt is more full and it moves farther. It does, it does, yeah. That's All right. a great way to say it. So in terms of the um, takeaway from mm -hmm. this, the, the, the most important takeaway from this Money Magazine report, what would you say that is? Well, to me, the, the takeaway is that uh, students from any economic situation and background can be successful, but you have to build the experience to meet their needs and stay laser focused on hiring advisors, hiring faculty, making sure uh, the course sections are available. You have to be intentional about removing barriers to their graduation success and, of course, their persistence uh, success. And it's, not, and it's not just about 
you know, getting a degree. It's about the quality of the experience here. Will they leave loving to learn? Uh, given that most futurists now say that 60% of jobs will have part of them automated within the next five or 10 years, we are now facing a situation where students have to be lifelong learners. And you know, we used to say that without much evidence about how important it is, but now we know it's really important. So the other par part of our um, goal is to be sure that we uh, make sure they, they know that we're, we're here for 60 years for them, not just the four years. And we just have a couple minutes before the break, and I want to bring up uh, the state budget. We did talk already about student loan and student loan debt, which is substantially lower for CSU students, and particularly here at Cal State Long Beach. Mm -hmm. Really quickly, before we go on to the question about the state budget, what's our formula here? What's the secret formula to keep the student debt low? Well, it's, I think it's, uh, we have, we've been working hard on philanthropy. 80% of our students get some kind of financial aid. Uh, because we have lots of students, and you may know that there's something called the State University Grant, and that's really uh, taking a third off of our tuition dollars that we reinvest into students who are low income. Uh, so between private uh, philanthropy, the State University Grant, uh, and then also the Cal Grants, we, and we work hard um, offering students a lot of help in figuring out financial aid uh, uh, you know, policies and how they can best use that. Also, we've been really working hard on campus jobs for students and also paid internships for students. And so, and all those things have an educational purpose as well as an economic, but we've been very intentional about trying to ease that burden as well as our massive now basic needs program. So we should never have a hungry student, we should never have a homeless student, both of which would obviously impede graduation. Let's move over to the state budget before we get to the break. Uh -huh. And uh, the state budget is at about 7.3 billion for this year, 4.1 billion approximately from uh, general fund taxpayers, and the other 3.2 billion, about 44 percent of it comes from student tuition and fees. Mm -hmm. So it's it's clear that the students are paying their share with the 44 percent. Um, the budget's about 500 million higher than it was a year ago. Um, is it enough to serve all the needs that we have here and uh, we want to be as great as we can be? So what do you think? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, I'm very grateful to the governor and the state legislature for, for offering us a budget that for only the now, I think, third time in six years covers all of our mandatory costs. Um, and th that's compensation, that's health, that's retirement. In the other years, we didn't get enough money, so we were really falling behind. And even though we got 2% was the average, uh, inflation was 3%. So it's been a difficult um, six years. It's my sixth budget uh, you know, that I have known about. Uh, having said that, though, um, I could compare nationally, and you know, California makes a much bigger investment. Uh, so we are in good shape on um, compensation, uh, agreed upon compensation, and, but where we really are um, hurting is that of the 100 buildings we have on campus, the average age is almost 50 years old. So our load of deferred maintenance is very, very high, as high as $300 million. The state did give the system, I think, over $200 million uh, for the entire system, but it's one-time money. So we, that really, that's a little bit of what keeps me up at night, is figuring out how to keep our buildings, uh, and I'm not talking about Taj Mahal's here, just updated for health and safety now with climate change, some air conditioning, really just for the health and safety of our staff, our faculty, and our students. On that note, we're going to have to go to the break. When we do come back from the break, we'll talk about the planning process underway that's going to change the future of the university. Stay tuned. Make a difference in our future by researching and helping to preserve our natural resources. The wide variety of careers in this field will have a huge impact on our lives while using the principles of engineering, chemistry, and biology to help find solutions to environmental problems. You can be a part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to In Conversation. I'm speaking today with President Jane Close Connolly. We're talking right now about the California state budget and how it relates to the CSU. 
And uh, Dr. Conley, when we were talking about uh, some of the concerns that keep you up at night in, in <laughs> terms of uh, aging infrastructure, obviously that's a concern yeah. for everyone that inhabits the buildings and, and needs to have the kinds of modern technology and modern facilities that, mm -hmm. that really um, force us into the future as far as the learning process, the technology process, and all of that. Um, but as you pointed out, um, state funds, although we're grateful for as much as we've received this year, we could always use more. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot to be done. And as I'm sort of hinted at in the, in the uh, other segment, we want to be as great as we can be. We don't want to just get by. We want to excel. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, it's always going to take more than um, general fund dollars. We've talked about that in the past, and I know you've talked about that, and the fact that we need to cultivate other sources of, of revenue and income. Mm -hmm. And where are we, in your estimation, uh, along that arc of cultivation for additional funding? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've been making good progress on the philanthropy side. Mm -hmm. I'm very pleased uh, this year that we've kind of broken the, we've, we've been uh, on private philanthropy, we've been attracting about uh, $30 million a year in investment. Now we're kind of broken that 30 and we're going closer to 35 and we uh -huh. have a 10 year goal to be closer to 50 by, uh, by 2030. Uh, so I think that's going well. We're putting a lot of energy into it, uh, a lot of thinking and a lot of reaching out. Uh, a, a new um, for us uh, approach has also been added where we're looking very purposefully at partnerships that are win-win. And I'll give you one example that's a public partnership with the city of Long Beach. That mm -hmm. city of Long Beach has granted us a million dollars to accelerate our um, building of classroom space down in downtown Long Beach so that we mm -hmm. could be more convenient to city workers and other people who work in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. We also have a partnership with Long Beach and other private investors for an accelerator mm -hmm. meant to attract uh, entrepreneurs, inventors, you know, big thinkers uh, to the city of Long Beach. We can win by that because our students can benefit. The city wins by that. And we could go to other businesses like Boeing where they have supported a lab for engineering. They win, we win. So we're looking much more aggressively and intentionally for those kinds of partnerships. They may look like internships. They may even look like service learning in certain areas. But the real goal is to create um, relationships where the, the business, the industry, the government really get something they need and we get something that we desperately need to improve the education of our students. And since we're talking about the future and planning, uh, that brings up the important planning initiative called Beach 2030 Plan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Beach 2030. What is it exactly? What was the genesis of it? And what's the purpose of it? Well, uh, the genesis was certainly my belief that you have to have a plan <laughs> or you don't know <laughs> when you've accomplished something. So, And it was also based, the, the, the form that it took was based on a very loud complaint I heard when I arrived here five years ago mm -hmm. was that we had a strategic plan, but there was no mm, kind of grassroots buy-in to it. It was really vice presidents talking to vice presidents. Now, to be fair, that those strategic plans made significant differences and improvements. But I am a believer in as much democracy in people's voices. It's harder, but I believe in that. So the form that it took to be as democratic as possible using an online forum and now multiple um, groups are working on, at this point, action plans. We have. I think we figured out in general terms vision, mission, values, and we have strategic priorities. Next stage will be um, what are the specific ways business is going to meet one of those priorities, or the academic senate, how, is, how are they going to do it, or the associated students, so it's, or individuals and, and programs. So we're, and so by the end of this semester, 2019, I think we'll have a good idea what people have written, and then we'll spend the spring massaging it into something beautiful. What have you learned so far? What are some of the preliminary results, would you say? Well, I'd say uh, the first uh, kind of great thing I learned was that people really care. So we had, uh, we've had well over four or 5,000 people involved, whether it was on the online event or in subsequent workshops and meetings. And so and they've generated many, many, I think, good ideas um, and different perspectives. Um, you know, a surprise I had was uh, certainly the internal um, interest, but also the external uh, interest. I called about a dozen 
uh, 15 external leaders all over California, you know, the head of the Public Policy Institute of California, the head of uh, LA Economic Development Council, the mayor, the, you know, and, and said, uh, would you talk to me? When we get to a certain point, will you talk to me about what's missing? Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it was very supported, I felt supported that there were, what, no hesitation, of course we'll do it. I think there's general agreement on our desire to increase access, um, that we should be serving as many students as we possibly can. Of course, that depends on state funding. Um, but another idea about that uh, are other audiences. There's millions of Californians who have some college but haven't finished. So are we doing enough with non so-called non-traditional age uh, uh, students? Uh, I think there was a lot of energy around the need to pay attention to our community make sure that people know that they belong here and that they are valued and that they have a voice here. So, uh, and then, you know, all the ideas about online and hybrid and different scheduling patterns and uh, more interdisciplinary work. So it's all been, it's been, been very exciting for me. Any surprises? Uh, I think probably the number of people who participated surprised me. You know, we were hoping, we were messaging out, you know, please, but uh, I've been in higher ed for quite a while and usually you say strategic plan and everybody rushes to leave the room. So <laughs> this was great that people stuck with us. Well, as far as uh, the plan itself, of course, you're going to gather all of the information and see where it leads. Um, and it's going to evolve, obviously, as everything does, mm -hmm. as social conditions change, as technology moves forward, things are going to uh, reflect that. Mm -hmm. Will we see the planning process begin to bear fruit well before 2030? What do you think? Yes. Um, in fact, I recently announced a couple of things that I call blinding flashes of the obvious, that they were, they were so present in people's thoughts that we've already started on, for example, a, uh, a more coordinated internship and outreach to industry and uh, government for our students to be involved. So we've done that already. We've also started uh, on work around an integrated behavioral and physical health model so that our students will have the best supports for their student success with their mental health, behavioral health, physical health. So there's already groups uh, working there. And you know, the best outcome for me, we, as you said, you never know what will the social conditions will be. The best outcome for me is that we'll have hundreds of, and I hope it might be thousands, of members of our community who are thinking this way. What's out there? What's, a, what's an opportunity? What should we be grabbing? What's a signal? You know, we talked about birth rates earlier, mm -hmm. uh, that, that we, maybe we need to change. So if we had a thousand members of our faculty, staff, and students who were always thinking that way and bringing ideas to the fore, I think we'll be thriving and, you know, at the top of our game in 2030. The point is the ball is rolling and the train is leaving the station. station. <laughs> and it's, it, to everyone's advantage to jump on the jump train on, now. Jump on, yeah. Jump on the train. Okay, well since we're talking about technology, there's another um, aspect of technology that we need to be concerned about and that is the threat of cybersecurity attacks. And we've seen this at a number, a number of large institutions, uh, retail operations as well as government agencies and even universities because they are large institutions with big data banks. And mm -hmm. typically that's what a lot of cyber criminals criminals are after mm -hmm. is the big data banks for one reason or the other, usually to steal the data. Yeah. And so obviously we have to be very aware and very concerned and prepared. What are we doing here to, to protect our data as well as we possibly can? So I uh, hired uh, for the first time ever a new vice president, um, uh, chief information officer, Dr. Min Yao, and he has been charged to really increase our resilience along that time, along that way. And soon we'll be rolling out uh, reorganization of some of our information technology assets, really aimed at creating resilience and increasing security because the hackers and the kind of trollers have become more and more sophisticated and it really takes, a, you know, real experts to, um, to know how to spot it and protect our students' data, our faculty members' and staff members' data, because as you're, you're right, and people are, sp I, I read recently that medical data are the, mm. top, the top target now, mm -hmm. that they can get social security so easily that that's not even, mm -hmm. you know, valuable anymore. That, that was 
quite arresting to me. <laughs> <laughs> and a little scary, too. And very scary, yeah. Uh, so as we talk about other aspects of the campus, we're starting to run down on time again, because mm -hmm. uh, as we talked about during the break, time is relentless, so we want to cover a little bit more about the campus and what's going on. Parking is always an issue at the beginning of the semester. <laughs> always, always, yeah. Um, it's been that way forever, I can tell you that, because I've been here a long time and it's always been a concern. What can we do going forward? So, you know, we have a lot of programs, but uh, we tried stacked parking, which is kind of valet parking where they put the cars in. Uh, actually, there were some bad experiences with it, but it, it was somewhat um, effective. We've tried off-site. We really liked that, but we couldn't find an off-site. We're uh, working now to see if we can make temporary extensions to some of the parking, the existing parking facilities to add five or 600 more spots. And it's important to me, even though it's been here forever, now we have 38,000 heads, you know, coming. We, our our full-time equivalent is about 30,000. But it's very stressful for students not to be able to find a parking place. And, uh, you know, we urge them to ride a bike, we urge them to take a bus, but that's not possible for all. Uh, mm -hmm. So we really are um, looking for additional spots, but it's almost impossible to do a major, you know, we can't figure out how to do a major parking structure anymore. They, we just can't find financing for that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're running down to about a minute now. So uh, I had other questions, but I'm going to go to the very end here. Yeah. And that is, any milestones to expect for this year? I know that uh, the men's volleyball team could potentially be in contention for a three-peat national championship. Other than that, any other milestones <laughs> that may occur? Well, we would love the three-peat. Wouldn't that be exciting? That would be amazing, yeah. So, you know, we have thousands of uh, events on, every year on campus. Uh, we'll have one of the largest forensic competitions. Of course, we'll have Pow Wow, and I uh, hope we'll have some more Big West and other conference uh, championships. There'll be a re renewed, revised homecoming coming up soon. Founders Day, we'll be celebrating for the first time in a long time. Be groundbreaking for the Alumni and Community Center. Um, and so there's going to be something happening almost every weekend. Uh, I'll be especially excited about the new dorm, the groundbreaking when we get for new student housing. That will be coming up because that will allow 476 uh, students to live on campus, more students to live on campus. So, so some capital improvement and some celebration of our diverse cultural um, uh, colleagues. Certainly some dynamic times here at Cal State Long Beach. Yes, to be sure. And I want to thank you for being here and sharing your time with us and, and giving us the rundown on 2030 in particular. Well, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition of In Conversation. Be sure to join us again soon for the next episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day. <laughs>